Hello and welcome back to my channel and welcome back to the Bible study with me series we're doing through the book of Esther. Today's video we're going to be in Esther chapter 4 so if you haven't already make sure you go back and watch the videos we already did on Esther's chapter 1, 2, and 3 so that you can understand the story leading up to this point in Esther chapter 4 where we're going to hear some of the most famous verses from the book of Esther. One little thing before we get into it, if you didn't see last week, my husband and I announced over on Instagram that we are expecting our first baby. And so I don't know if you're going to be able to see, but here's a little, little bump date, but we got baby with us as we're filming this Bible study series, but let's go ahead and get into it. So a little refresher on the book of Esther. Esther is a historical narrative set over a hundred years after the Babylonian exile of Israelites from Israel. And so at this point, some Jews have returned to Jerusalem to begin rebuilding the city. And a lot of them though have not returned. And so Esther tells the story of a Jewish community living in Susa, which is the capital city of the ancient Persian empire. It's gonna tell the story of how God uses this Jewish maiden to save her people. Like we've been talking about, God's name is actually not mentioned one time throughout the entire book of Esther, but the important thing to remember as we go throughout this study is that God's name is not in this book, but his hand certainly is. Through every chapter we've already seen, God just moving behind the scenes, setting things in place, and the absence of his name is meant to point to his presence of how he is working so presently behind the scenes, even though we can't overtly see him. And so another refresher, the theme statement of this book from the Bible Project, it says that God's seeming absence does not mean that he has abandoned his people. He uses the faithfulness of even morally compromised people living in a messy world to accomplish his purposes and fulfill his promises. This book asks us to trust God even when we can't see him working and to hold to the confident hope that no matter how bad things get, God is actively working to redeem his world. And so again, that's from the Bible Project. The Bible Project video on Esther is linked down below. And with the sermons I'm gonna reference, all my other Bible study tools, my Bible, highlighters, the journal, which we are gonna be using in this video. We're gonna be doing the deeper study section and doing the journal kind of overview. So a little refresher on the story so far. Let's get us caught up to speed. We've got King Ahasuerus, who is the king of Persia, this giant empire. And he holds a six month party and basically at this party, asks his wife, Queen Vashti, to parade her beauty in front of his drunk friends, and she refuses and is kicked out of the role of being a queen. Then four years later, the king returns, likely from not being able to conquer or invade Greece, and he remembers what happened with Vashti and holds this beauty contest to select a new queen. And Esther, this Jewish maiden who is living in Susa, is chosen as queen. And then five years after this point, so we now have had Esther in the role of queen for five years, Mordecai is in his position in the king's courts. And again, Mordecai is Esther's cousin. Um, we've got this going on. And during this time, it then says that Haman is promoted to basically being second in charge under the king. And we talked a lot about Haman's ancestry and the significance of that in the last video. And so check that out if you didn't already. But basically, he is mad that Mordecai won't bow down to him along with everybody else who is bowing down to him when he gets promoted to this position. And so Haman devises this plot to kill the Jews because basically it says that it wasn't worth his time even to just seek after Mordecai. He wanted to go after his entire people group, the Jews, to utterly destroy them. And so Haman casts lots to determine when this evil plan is going to be executed. And at the time when he's making this decision, it's the first month of the year, and it says that this is going to happen basically 11 months from now. And so this is how chapter three ends, which leads us to chapter four. So in chapter four, we have one subheading, and it is Esther agrees to help the Jews. And so we're gonna see how she does that and how that comes about. 
and that covers the entire chapter, which is 17 verses. But like we've been doing through this whole study, we're just going to read through the entire chapter without stopping to really get the flow of the story. And then we'll go back through the entire thing and walk through it and unpack it. And like I mentioned, we will be picking a couple verses from this chapter to do a deeper study on. And so that will be towards the end of the video. If you haven't already, please be sure to subscribe to my channel and then also give this video a thumbs up if you've been enjoying this study. And again, if you've got a friend who you think would like to go through it with you, be sure to share it with them as well. But without further ado, if you have a Bible, go ahead and turn with me to Esther chapter four. Verse one. When Mordecai learned all that had been done, Mordecai tore his clothes and put on sackcloth and ashes and went out into the midst of the city and he cried with a loud and bitter cry. He went up to the entrance of the king's gate for no one was allowed to enter the king's gate clothed in sackcloth. And in every province, wherever the king's command and his decree reached, there was great mourning among the Jews with fasting and weeping and lamenting, and many of them lay in sackcloth and ashes. When Esther's young women and her eunuchs came and told her, the queen was deeply distressed. She sent garments to clothe Mordecai so that he might take off his sackcloth, but he would not accept them. Then Esther called for Hatak, one of the king's eunuchs, who had been appointed to attend her, and ordered him to go to Mordecai to learn what this was and why it was. Hatak went out to Mordecai in the open square of the city in front of the king's gate, and Mordecai told him all that had happened to him and the exact sum of money that Haman had promised to pay into the king's treasuries for the destruction of the Jews. Mordecai also gave him a copy of the written decree issued in Susa for their destruction that he might show it to Esther and explain to her and command her to go to the king to beg his favor and plead with him on behalf of her people. And Hatak went and told Esther what Mordecai had said. Then Esther spoke to Hatak and commanded him to go to Mordecai and say, All the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces know that if any man or woman goes to the king inside the inner court without being called, there is but one law, to be put to death, except the one to whom the king holds out the golden scepter so that he may live. But as for me, I have not been called to come into the king these thirty days. And they told Mordecai what Esther had said. Then Mordecai told them to reply to Esther, do not think to yourself that in the king's palace you will escape any more than all the Jews. For if you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another place, but you and your father's house will perish. And who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Then Esther told them to reply to Mordecai, Go, gather all the Jews to be found in Susa, and hold a fast on my behalf, and do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my young women will also fast as you do. Then I will go to the king, though it is against the law, and if I perish, I perish. Mordecai then went away and did everything as Esther had ordered him. All right, so if you remember how Esther chapter three ended, Haman comes up with this plan to destroy the Jews. And that very last sentence is that the king and Haman sat down to drink, but the city of Susa was thrown into confusion. And so we now see chapter four open with Mordecai lamenting and grieving. And it says that he tore his clothes and put on sackcloth and ashes and went to the midst of the city and cried with a loud and bitter cry. So he is very openly grieving and lamenting this horrible news. And that's echoed by everyone else throughout the province. It says in every province, wherever the decree had reached, there was great mourning among the Jews with fasting and weeping and lamenting. And so the first thing I want to read is a note from my study Bible on verse one. 
it's referring to the sackcloth and ashes and the fasting and the weeping and it just simply says that those are traditional ways of expressing grief in the ancient near east and so that is what they were doing they were grieving and expressing that grief a note from the enduring word commentary says that though mordecai was anguished at all of this we remember also that his integrity was the cause of it. So him not bowing down to Haman is essentially what brought this about. And so this note says that he cried with a loud and bitter cry, but he would not change his mind or grovel at the feet of Haman to save himself or his people. He was maintaining that integrity. And then it just says again that Mordecai's reaction was imitated all throughout the Persian Empire in these very public expressions of grief and horror. And so we've got Mordecai grieving, we've got Jews all throughout the city grieving, and then we get to verse four and it says, when Esther's young women and eunuchs came and told her, the queen was deeply distressed. And so another note from the Enduring Word commentary says that living in the isolation of the palace, Esther had not yet been made aware of this decree. And so she didn't know this news yet that the Jews were going to be destroyed. And before she understood this decree, she could not understand why Mordecai was making such a spectacle of himself, which again, maybe kind of speaks to why she then sent him clothes to clothe himself. Another reason for that is something I found in the study Bible again. It says that given the ban of verse two, which if we look at verse two, it says that no one was allowed to enter the king's gate if they were clothed in sackcloth. And so given this, Esther probably feared for Mordecai's safety. And so she wanted to cover him up and make sure that he was safe. But it says that Mordecai would not accept these garments. And then it says that then Esther called for Hatak, which I hope I'm saying that right, who was one of the king's eunuchs and basically sent this guy to Mordecai to figure out what this was all about and why. And so this Hatak guy goes to Mordecai and Mordecai tells him everything, including the exact sum of money that Haman was going to put into the king's treasury in order to destroy the Jews. And then Mordecai also gives this guy a copy of the decree that was sent out so that he could bring it back to Esther and explain it to her and urge her to go and talk to the king and plead with him on behalf of the Jewish people. Hatak, this messenger guy, comes back to Esther and explains everything and basically also presents Mordecai's request that she would go in and talk to the king. And Esther responds by saying, there's a well-known law that everybody knows that no one can just go into the court of the king uninvited because if he does, if she does, they will be put to death. And the one exception is if the king chooses to extend his scepter so that that person may live. And we've already kind of gotten a little character development on King Ahasuerus. And we know that he's just very kind of given over to whatever whim of the moment, whether that's alcohol or to the opinions of people or kind of just even what mood he is in. And so this was an incredibly risky situation because she had not been summoned by the king. She is literally risking her life to go into his courts, basically just hoping that he's in a good mood that day and that he extends this scepter so that she may live. And so Mordecai makes this request and Esther basically writes back through this Hatak guy saying, here's the risk here. Esther clearly has hesitation here. She is afraid, she is nervous, but I think it's cool for our benefit at least that she vocalizes this law and it explains something that Mordecai probably already knew as to why this would be a risk because now we can understand in reading through this story what is at stake in her going to talk to the king? Because without this context and this knowledge of this law that the king could literally have her killed for this, we could hear this request and think, yeah, that's not a big deal. She just needs to go and talk to her husband and explain the situation and ask that her people would be saved. But this was a very, very weighty, very significant risk that she was putting herself into. And so that is her response. And another note on that from my study Bible, again on verse 11, says that the law in this matter was absolute, without any qualifications or exceptions. The strict court etiquette shows the king's total power 
over the lives of his subjects. And then at the end of Esther's kind of repeal back to Mordecai, she says, as for me, I have not been called to come into the king for these 30 days. And this note continues in the study Bible saying, this is an indication potentially that the king's love for Esther may have begun to wane, making Esther's task even more difficult. So in chapter two, when Esther is chosen king, we just hear about how the king has such favor for Esther and he's just really drawn to her. And we don't know that that's not the case anymore, but we have to remember that five years have passed since she was chosen as queen and since they have been married. And it's been 30 days since he's called to see her. And so maybe some of that infatuation had wore off a little bit. And so this again is just kind of building this case that this was a tremendous risk that Esther was taking. But now we get to the part of this chapter, which is also the probably most famous popular part of this entire book. And that is how Mordecai responds back to Esther. He says, and I'm just gonna read it again. He told them to reply to Esther and say, do not think for yourself that in the king's palace you will escape any more than all the other Jews. For if you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another place, but you and your father's house will perish. And who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. That last part is a part that we see on coffee mugs all the time on cute little Pinterest quotes. And it talks about being created for such a time as this, which is so powerful. And this is the context where that verse happens. And so a couple notes on this little section of verses here, that Mordecai is convinced of God's faithfulness. This note from the Enduring Word commentary says that Mordecai's trust was in the faithfulness of God, not in the faithfulness of Esther. He knew that God will not let his people down, even if individuals let God down. This reminds me from the verse, I believe it's in one of the Timothys that says, he is faithful even when we are faithless. And continuing on with this note from the commentary, it says, though the fate of God's people rested in God and not Esther, her own fate in this situation depended on her own faithfulness to God. And so essentially Mordecai is saying, look, you can keep quiet to try to save yourself, but how do you know that you're gonna be spared among this destruction of the Jews because you yourself are a Jew. And when the king finds this out, when Haman finds this out, it could bode just as poorly for you. And so he says, if you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another place. And so here's that part we're talking about where Mordecai is confident in God's faithfulness. He firmly believes that God is going to, in some way, deliver the Jews. And so he's telling Esther, look, if you don't step up to this opportunity, God's gonna accomplish his purpose through some other way, but you and your father's house will perish. And so again, Mordecai isn't depending on Esther's faithfulness. He has full assurance that God is going to be faithful no matter what, but he is urging Esther that her own well being might be dependent on her faithfulness in this matter because she could just as much be in danger. I think this is such a cool reminder here that we kind of hear from Mordecai that God's purposes will prevail whether or not we are obedient, but God gives us the opportunity to participate in his redemptive process. God wants to work through you. God wants to work through me. He has a plan already for each of us of how he wants to do that. And so God's purposes are not gonna be thwarted. I think of Job 42, two, where it says, I know that no purpose of yours can be thwarted, talking about God. Our obedience or lack thereof isn't gonna change God's ultimate purpose. He is still going to accomplish that, but he invites us to take part in that. And we get to decide if we're gonna step up into that role, even with the courage it requires, 
or if we are going to shrink back and let ourselves miss that opportunity to play a key role in God's redemptive plan. The other thing we see from this verse is that God strategically places us according to his purposes and his providential timing. And we see this here in Mordecai's key line of, who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. And all throughout this book, we've been talking about how these things just so happened, right? How it just so happened that Queen Vashti is kicked out of her role. It just so happened that Esther is among the 400 women from millions who are chosen to participate in this beauty contest. It just so happened that the eunuch took favor with her, that the king took favor with her, and that out of these millions of women, she is chosen to be queen. It just so happened that her and Mordecai were even living in Susa. They hadn't returned back to Jerusalem. It just so happened that Mordecai was put in this position in the king's courts. And so all these things just so happened, but they didn't just so happen. We see God orchestrating it, him strategically positioning her in this place for such a time as this. And guys, the same is true for us. Where you were born, the exact time you are living in, the exact people you're surrounded by, none of it is a mistake. God strategically positioned each of us where we are in order to accomplish the purpose is that he wants to accomplish through us and none of it is a mistake. We were born for such a time as this and in the families we were born into, in the areas we were born into, with the friends that we have, God wants to use all of it and he has a purpose in all of it just like he did for Esther. And after hearing this, I love Esther's response. She says, okay, go and gather all the Jews all of the Jews to be found in Susa, all of these Jews who have been openly grieving and lamenting and mourning at this horrible news. She says, go and gather all of them and hold with them a fast on my behalf. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day, and then I and my young women are going to do the same. Then I will go to the king, even though it's against the law, and if I perish, I perish. And I love here that Esther is willing to obey God at all costs. And this makes me think back to what we talked about, I think in chapter two or three, where we talked about how Esther was obeying Mordecai and the obedience that she was able to display was a result of learning that growing up, of already having that practiced obedience. And that led to this even more key moment here of her deciding and resolving to obey God no matter what it was going to cost her and to step into that opportunity he had given her. This kind of ties into Matthew 10, 28, which says, do not fear those who can kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. I think there was something in Esther that knew that she couldn't back down from this opportunity that God had given her and to not fear those who could kill her body, but could not do anything to touch her soul. The other part I love about Esther's response is that she is intentional in preparing for this risk that she was going to take and she prepares through fasting. It talks about gathering all these Jews to fast and her young women to fast and she was going to fast along with them for three days and three nights. And biblically we see that fasting is tied to prayer, prayer and fasting. Matthew 17, 20, Jesus himself reminds us that special spiritual battles sometimes require special preparation with prayer and fasting. And so as much as Esther was willing to take this risk and to step into it, she doesn't do so nonchalantly. She prepares. She is intentional in fasting and praying to prepare for this monumental step that she is going to take. Another note from my study Bible says in regards to this fast that is going to happen among the Jews, it says that this is not a spontaneous outpouring of grief like we heard about in the beginning of the chapter, but rather an organized activity aimed at increasing Esther's chances of success through earnest prayer. And this here is the strongest indication we have yet of Esther and Mordecai's faith in God. And then even so, in her final remark though, she says, if I perish, I perish. And this note continues on in the study Bible saying, Esther realizes that even so, 
God cannot be manipulated even by fasting, that she was going to do her part to take this to God in prayer, to fast, to prepare. But at the end of the day, God's will was going to be done. And that if it was God's will for the king to not extend that scepter, then she says, look, if I perish, I perish. And this makes me think of Daniel 3, 17, that famous line that says, God is able to save us, talking about being saved from the fiery furnace. But even if not, he is still good. And so this idea of bringing our will before God, praying, but then ultimately recognizing at the end of the day that his will is going to be done and his goodness doesn't depend on whether or not it's the outcome we think should happen. And so this is such a picture here of faith. And so this is how this chapter is closing, is this pinnacle moment, this risk is set up for us. And Esther says, I'm going to take the step forward. I'm going to take this risk in order to obey God and to save my people. And the final verse is because Esther gives these orders to gather the Jews and to organize this fast. The final verse says that Mordecai then went away and did everything as Esther had ordered him. And I think that's kind of an interesting little verse in there because all throughout the chapters leading up to this, we hear how Esther obeys Mordecai. And now we hear of Mordecai obeying what Esther had commanded him to do. And so again, they're both just working together to accomplish the purpose that God has set out before them. And so that is Esther chapter four. And we are going to be doing a further study section today, a deeper study section today. And so for that, we're going to be looking at those famous verses, Esther chapter four, verses 13 and 14. And so I'm going to pull out my scribe Bible journal and we'll dig in. This is just a study Bible or sorry, a study journal where we can kind of write things out and it's linked below if you have any questions. So let's get to it. Okay, so I wrote out that verse again. It says, Do not think to yourself that in the king's palace you will escape any more than all the other Jews. For if you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another place, but you and your father's house will perish. And who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. So the first thing I want to do is write down a couple of those statements we talked through as we are reading through it. And so the first one is that God's purposes will prevail whether or not we are obedient, but he gives us the opportunity to participate in his redemptive purposes. And then I'm just going to make a little note to Job 42, 2, which says that no purpose of God's can be thwarted. Next is that God strategically places us according to his purposes and providential timing. And finally, as I was thinking through this, I was just thinking through how Esther had this fear that her stepping forward to talk to the king would lead to just dangerous things, which was a valid fear, potentially to her dying. But then again, just this idea that the very reason perhaps she was even in that position was for this purpose of taking that risk and saving her people. And I just think about how often we fear the outcomes of obeying God or doing the right thing or loving people when in reality, God put us in those positions for that very purpose. And so I just wanna make a note on that. Okay, so I put that oftentimes we can fear the outcome of obeying God or loving people in action, but what if God put us in those opportunities for that very purpose? And so I am going to now spend this application section just thinking through this and thinking through how it could apply to my life. Okay, I just kind of reflected through this and ended with a reflection question. Here's what I put. The exact time I was born, the exact family and friends I have, my unique sphere of influence, along with where I am geographically, in this point in history, the difficult situations I face, none of it is by chance. All of it is ordained by God for His purposes. What are areas I'm afraid to be bold for God for fear of the outcome? But what if he strategically positioned me in those opportunities for such a time as this? I loved going through this chapter together 
Be sure to comment down below letting me know what verse stood out to you most or something new that you learned. And then again, if you are enjoying this study and enjoyed this chapter, please be sure to give this video a thumbs up. Thank you so much for watching and going through this study with me. And I will see you back here next week for Esther chapter five. Bye.